from Madhukar and uh, Atul and then Indranath um, and now yourself. <coughs> Avik is going to be speaking next. Of course, Ravi Kothari. Ravi also. speaking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, uh, it's been a huge contribution uh, from the network um, to uh, the webinar series specifically. And um, in fact, some of uh, the folks, uh, you know, Atul, for example, uh, is actually even mentoring a, a project, uh, a panel wow. project within uh, Subod. And of course, we have a few other speakers in the webinar series, like, uh, uh, you know, we, we had uh, Vikas Agarwal uh, speak here from yeah. Oracle, and he's also mentoring one project. We've got... Okay. Um, um, Trying to remember, Pratibha Mugi uh, is also uh, she's moved to IBM interestingly now. So uh, you know she's oh. also um, moved on from twenty four by seven, uh, but she is uh, going to be um, uh, you know mentoring a project here, and uh, so you know it's really been fantastic. And so thank you for that, uh, but thank you also okay. for bringing um, you know to light uh, you know Bayesian models. Um, you know, I had a comment recently, I was teaching somewhere, I won't mention the institute, but I was speaking, uh, teaching somewhere. And, um, you know, one of the comments was, you know, nobody talks about Bayesian belief networks anymore, right? It's all neural networks. So is this kind of really old fashioned stuff that I was saying, <laughs> you know, well, actually, if you look at neural networks, uh, they're also actually just estimating probability distributions. And yes. so, you know, a lot of blogs, unfortunately, that are written by people that, um, uh, don't necessarily understand the foundation talk about how you know bayesian thinking is irrelevant right <laughs> now that we have you know, um so i'm really really glad yeah. you um, decided to speak about this and uh, thank you but uh, rather than me carrying on the way i am uh, i shall pass it on to you now and uh, switch off my mic and uh, video and um, look forward to listening to you <clears throat> so over to you deep all right. Uh, thanks a lot, Saurabh. I mean, um, you know, the AI or analytics leaders network, what do you want to call it? Uh, having folks like yourself in that group, such an informal group, but people just get together and talk about things. I think that's uh, been super. Uh, and and I, 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 you know, uh, I think uh, intellectual capacity of the group has increased because of your presence. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, um, uh, and for everyone, I mean, when I when when sort of asked me to speak, uh, I, I I know the people who have spoken before me in this webinar series, and uh, I was like, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't don't hold a candle to those guys. What will I talk about? Um, and uh, you know, there are of course interesting use cases in the business and this and that. And I know that a lot of folks will come and talk about business aspects of analytics, of AI, of data science. Um, and I thought that's interesting. Of course, that's super interesting. Uh, but you guys are learning things now, right? And I thought that it might be um, a good idea uh, to bring over to this series and to all of you, right, uh, who are part of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the mentoring process that Sub Foundation does and others have joined. I mean, if you are in the learning phase of your life, uh, to bring in a few new things which are not traditionally taught in data science programs, right? And and we don't teach it either. I mean, I I, I co-run a program um, at at Jigsaw with uh, with the University of Chicago. Uh, we don't teach this stuff. Um, I I know more or less the programs of most of the data science uh, you know, certifications degrees that are going around. And don't get me wrong, they're all solid programs, very good, really talented faculty, uh, wonderful material, very applied. Uh, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, there are certain things which uh, interest me uh, personally, and, and I don't know why, uh, but uh, uh, that I think uh, do not probably uh, get uh, uh, the amount of uh, screen time it showed uh, in, in most areas, right? So I thought, why don't I bring some of those here together? Um, part of uh, the, 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 the session today, uh, I sort of never gave me a time, right? Is it a one hour session, 45 minutes, 20 minutes, two hours? I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but we I thought- greedy. We are greedy, Deep. So, you know, we typically, uh, these run for an hour and a half, but we are quite happy for it to run longer also. Okay. Now, uh, yeah, I, I thought about an hour or so, uh, but then we can do question answers. 
Uh, and in the end, what I did, even if it was a one hour session or maybe less, um, what I wanted to bring today uh, were a few things, right, which, uh, which I like. Uh, one of this, of course, the core of the, uh, of the session will be about causal inferencing. A lot of the work will, which we will discuss is by Judea Pearl and others, uh, his co-authors. Uh, <clears throat> from personal experience, Arab, uh, you know, my first job after grad school was at Dow Jones Indexes. And uh, you know, when, I, when you enter the campus, uh, uh, Dow Jones campus, they have a large, large place in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and, and that's where they published the Wall Street Journal from, right? This was back in the days. I mean, now they've sold off the journal, the indexes have been sold, whatever, whatever, but uh, this is decades ago. Uh, <clears throat> you could, you would walk in and uh, at the, there was a corridor, at the end of the corridor, there was one bust, yeah? Uh, right in the beginning was Charles Dow's bust, the founder of the Dow theory and the Dow Jones indexes and all of that. In the corridor, um, there's a man called Daniel Pearl. I don't know if you remember him. Um, Daniel Pearl was an American journalist uh, who was killed uh, and his murder was videotaped by the Taliban. And uh, they put it up. And this was one of the first high profile killings by the Taliban. They made a movie out of it. Uh, Angelina Jolie played his wife and stuff like that. Uh, Judea Pearl is Daniel Pearl's father. Uh, I didn't know it back then. Uh, I found out later. Right? Um, and he's doing amazing work other than the work that he does on AI about uh, you know, communal harmony. That how um, you know, it doesn't have to be divisive. So really interesting historical aspect there. Uh, fantastic man, uh, old guy, awesome stuff. Some of the work that he does. I don't know Pearl personally. Some of the people I mentioned in my talk today, I've met them, I've uh, personally interacted with them. Thankfully, I've had the good fortune. I'll, I'll discuss some of that work as well. Um, <clears throat> but other than the work that is being done by Pearl and historically his predecessors in that field, the other thing that I wanted to bring in right at the end are other ways of looking at causal inferencing. And um, you know, part of what I intend to do, so question to you guys and don't answer it, right? Please don't answer it. How many of you have had uh, LSD, right? Lysergic acid diethylamide. Yeah? It's considered to be a mind enhancing drug. Um, so don't answer the question. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Atul Tripathi might be following the video and uh, uploading it somewhere. I don't know, the government knows, so don't answer the question. But the point is that, uh, you know, uh, Aldous Huxley and those guys, they used to have LSD and say, oh, it enhances your mind. Uh, what I really want to do today uh, is a little bit of mind enhancement, okay? Um, now, I don't know how well it will work uh, and whether it makes too much sense or not, because what I want to showcase to you guys is that, look, other than the traditional way of looking at statistics, econometrics, data science, and machine learning. Uh, there are some other threads of research that are going around, which are talking about causality, which are going beyond uh, the association rules that we discuss most often. And uh, <clears throat> some of these uh, potentially uh, are going to change the way we think about artificial intelligence, the way we think about human intelligence and their artificial intelligence. So I'm going to bring those in. Um, of course, uh, I'll, I'm happy, Sarab, if you want to share my email ID or whatever with your students, if they have any follow-up questions, because during the talk, I can only touch up about certain things. Uh, as I told you, I, might, I, I was initially thinking about making it quite mathematical and start deriving things on the, on the uh, you know, webinar. Uh, we won't do a lot of that, uh, but what I want to do is pique your curiosity in these areas, right? Um, because uh, we are we are all just running libraries most often, right? Uh, somebody else creates a library, I clean up my data, I spend a ton of day, time, you know, cleaning up the data, and plugging in a library created by somebody else. Uh, and that's data science today. <laughs> Well, Deep, uh, what I would love is if you can provide us with some resources after the yeah. webinar as well. Absolutely. So we upload this into our platform and we give them the list of resources so that they can do Sure, that. sure. No, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to. More and than happy. And thank you for Positive. suggesting that they can email you and get uh, more detail from you. So that we will definitely share your uh, email ID with them. Thank sure. you. Sure. Yeah, yeah. No, happy to help if I can in any ways. Um, all right. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's begin. Um, so all of you, I'm hoping, uh, can uh, see my screen. And uh, <clears throat> the title uh, is Causal Inferencing and Arguably, Arguably, The Makings of a Revolution, right? Uh, 
So uh, we know that correlation is not causation. This is something that has been told to me from the day. I mean, I've been I've been uh, dealing with this nonsense from the time I was uh, very young. I started studying economics and uh, the university where I went to. All our professors were like, you know, unless you can mathematically lay it out, right? Economics is useless. So a lot of math and econometrics and so on and. Um, and, and they kept telling us at the end of every class, pretty much, that correlation is not causation. I'm like, wouldn't it be great if my mother was a statistician, right? She would say, oh, you didn't study enough, and that's why you flunked your exam. I, I could just tell her, hey, you're just looking at correlation. <laughs> not make a causal inference based on the data, which says that the number of hours I studied is going down, therefore my grades are going down, right? Correlation, spurious correlation, doesn't matter. I can do well. Good to know. Um, but uh, all of us know that who works with correlations? We have so many cool things, right, uh, that we can uh, work with. The challenge is that if correlation is not causation, then linear regression is also effectively not causation, right? Because uh, as we know, that linear regression, your beta is nothing else but your standard deviation of y divided by standard deviation of x multiplied by your correlation between x and y. So if correlation is not causation, then I can argue and, and argue with simple mathematics right, that's in front of you that uh, linear regression is not causation either. Um, because, uh, you know, your beta is covariance xy divided by your variance of x. The correlation you know is your covariance xy divided by standard deviation of x multiplied by standard deviation of y. Thus, sy sx multiply sy by sx multiplied by correlation of x and y. That's your beta. Nothing else, right? You don't need gradient descent or OLS or regressions to do that. You can do it on Excel, right? Uh, I don't know uh, if, <clears throat> I'm sure Sarab's taught you this, but you can actually take a very simple, uh, you know, you can take all your data, put it in an Excel file and create this on your own. All you need to do is you know, calculate the means and the variances and you can get your data. It doesn't take rocket science. You don't need variance and all that. And linear regression, if it is not causation, then logistic regression is also not causation because all of you know that linear logistic regression is nothing but linear regression after a few drinks, right? Uh, Three-step transformation. Uh, which takes you from a linear regression to a logistic regression, right? Instead of a y, you move to a probability of y, right? Percentage, historical percentages. Uh, from the probability of y, you get to your odds ratio. From your odds ratio, you take the log and you get your log odds ratio. So logistic regression and linear regression are very, very similar models, right? There's nothing that, uh, that, that, that says that uh, if, if linear regression is not causation, um, that will directly imply that my logistic regression is also not causation. Okay, so we moved from correlations to linear regression to logistic regression and debunked any idea of causation in any of them. But, but when we answer questions to businesses, to ourselves, to governments, doesn't matter where you work, we are always talking about X causes Y. But mathematically, when we are doing it. We are saying, oh, X and Y are related. We are not trying to prove any causation anywhere. So no causation. One of the reasons I think that, uh, and, and this is, uh, Pearl feels very strongly about it, writes about it in all his books, uh, that some of the founders of the field of statistics, they didn't, they, they, they considered causation to be a bogeyman. They said, you don't need causation. Um, you know, so, so causation is a bogeyman and do not disturb that. Don't try to move that around. Okay. live with correlations. So it became extremely unfashionable in the world of statistics to talk about causation uh, pretty early on, right? So your uh, Fisher and your Pearson, and all of these big guys, they didn't like, I mean, uh, they didn't like uh, causation. The, in, a, anybody mentioning causation in a statistical paper uh, couldn't get it published, right? So it just became unfashionable. One of the challenges of academia, and and uh, you know, and this is not personal. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not an academic, but even if I was, I would uh, I, I would recognize it. Is that uh, like every industry, uh, academics or academia also goes through fashion cycles. Right? 
So something becomes fashionable and something drops by the wayside. Uh, if you think of traditional economics, right? The moment uh, <clears throat> Samuelson, Paul Samuelson brought integrals um, and, and path diagrams and things like that to traditional economics, any idea of heterodox economics, right? Complexity in economics, they, they just fell by the wayside. Everybody was like, oh, can you put it into calculus? Can you derive it? You cannot derive it. It's nonsense. I'm not going to publish it. So fantastic economists like Lance Taylor and Kalechki, uh, who were publishing in the American Economic Review and Econometrica till a certain year, you'll see that once Samuelson became very powerful, their publications went to tier three journals because no one wanted to talk about heterodox economics anymore. They were like, no, we, we, we need certain types of consumer preference structures, right? We, we need certain types of behavior, which we believe is the right way to behave, which is the way human beings behave. They don't, right? Most of economics is a lie. And I'll come back to that later. Um, uh, and, and that's part of what I'm going to do today. I'm going to try to say nasty things about all the disciplines that we deal with, econometrics, economics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of them. Right? Um, you, can, you can throw things at me uh, virtually. Uh, thankfully, I'm on the other side of the screen. Um, so uh, the whole idea of causation became very unfashionable. And Seawall Wright, who's one of the uh, legends uh, in, in, in the study of causation, um, and there are some others right, who I'll mention uh, right away, uh, in epidemiology and other social sciences, their work started getting sidetracked, right? Um, so Henley Koch, 1877, 1882, Hen Henley and Koch's postulates, right? They have four postulates of causal relationships. So this is really old stuff. Right? But I keep telling my students and, and uh, everyone that, look, a lot of the stuff that we are talking about today, mm, it's not like human beings just suddenly came up with it today. Right? I mean, it's not like, oh, I, I woke up and say, oh, you know, uh, convolutional neural nets. There, there's a long history which leads to the final CNN. Um, however, uh, you know, uh, it, most of the work or a large chunk of the work has been done. Right? Most of statistics that we learn, you know, linear regression, this, that, that's Gaussian stuff, right? Pretty, pretty old. So Cox stated four postulates which should be met before a causal relationship can be accepted between a bacterial parasite and the disease in question, all right? So four things, uh, and, and I'll show you another uh, updated version of it, right? So again, watch, uh, Henley and Koch here are not talking about correlations. They are talking about causal relationship. And what they're saying is that the agent must be shown to be present in every case of the disease by isolation. The agent, agent must not be found in cases of other diseases, right? So your mal malarial parasite, it should be present in everyone who has malaria, it shouldn't be present in people who do not have malaria, right? They have some other kind of diseases. Once isolated, the agent must be capable of representing the disease in experimental animals. So once I've isolated, this is the agent that causes this disease. I have the parasite, I'm gonna inject it into some poor animal, right? Um, and, and you'll see that the animal is gonna get that disease as well, right? And that animal might be a human being in human trials, right? And the agent must be recovered from the experimental disease produced. So the fourth step is that once I have injected uh, this poor uh, guinea pig with my uh, malarial parasites and given that person, uh, given that guinea pig malaria, I should be able to recover the agent again, right? Because if the agent goes in, the agent dies, the, per, per, the, the animal still has a malaria, that means there's something else. Now, um, these are quite, quite intuitive, right? I mean, this is nothing which requires, uh, you, know, uh, you know, differential equations or, or optimization techniques. Very, very intuitive. Uh, and and uh, often, simply your data can tell you this. You don't need anything beyond your data. You slice and dice your data, you can get all of these. But the good thing or the beauty of this is that it's not talking about correlations. It's talking about causation. Okay. Um, Hill's criteria, Austin Hill, uh, for, for some reason, these guys live a lot. I and mean, if you look at Seawall Wright, 1889 to 1988, right? Um, uh, I, I, I keep saying that academics live long lives, right? I, I wish that's what I'd be doing. Um, Austin Hill uh, created the first complete statement and uh, came up with eight, right? Uh, causal attributes that are necessary, okay? 
uh, consistency, strength, specificity, so on and so forth, right? I won't go into the details of these, uh, but, uh, you know, of course, uh, any further study that you want to look at and understand the history, because the way I like to think about any literature that I study and whether it's, uh, you know, causal, causal inferencing or whether it's statistics and machine learning, I like to think about it very historically. It just uh, helps my uh, brain kind of uh, create markers, right, on the way. Um, and, and I keep seeing that sometimes these historical ideas give me great research ideas or interesting research ideas, I won't call it great, uh, because uh, you, you also find things which you find interesting, uh, which became unfashionable. All right, and something new, Susser's criteria, and this is quite tied in to a lot of econometrics that we do or data science that we do. In agreement with these previous authors, he mentioned two criteria that have to be present for any association that has a claim to be causal. Remember, cause and effect. A happens because of A happening, B happens. Susser came up with two things. One is time order. That if X causes Y, or if X increases the probability of Y, it doesn't have cause cause, right? But just increase the probability in a population or, or in your data, then X must precede Y. X should happen first, Y should happen later, okay? And direction which is X leads to Y. The unfortunate part, if you uh, <laughs> will uh, allow me to say that, uh, is that uh, the first part, which is your time order, that got picked up by econometricians. They realized that, okay, this makes sense, right? Even your Bayesian networks, Bayes and so on, right? This happens first, then this happens, therefore X leads to Y. Okay, fair enough, time, time, uh, time order. Directionality, right, is something that Susser mentioned, again, talked about, but we didn't really have the algebra for directionality in traditional probability theory, and I'll come to that in greater detail in a few more minutes, okay? So I have my time order. If X causes Y or X, you know, increases the probability of Y, X must precede Y, okay? Uh, that's easier to work with, all right? Directionality, on the other hand, uh, once you look at the underlying algebra or the calculus or simply the probability theory uh, of direction X leading to Y, uh, we have a little bit of a challenge there. So what about econometrics? We talked about traditional statistics during this. Uh, you know that there are uh, econometric models of causality. I'm guessing some of you at least have heard of or worked with grandeur causality. Uh, I'm sure that's something that, I don't know if that's something that's taught to you. Uh, but uh, Clive Granger, I think he won the Nobel Prize and so on, one of the greatest econometricians of, your, of our time, right? Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the whole idea behind Granger causality is this increase in probability, right? that if I see X, there's an increase in probability of Y, right? so there's an intertemporal element, okay? If that happens, we can say that X Granger causes Y, Again, there's a caveat like econometricians love to do. They will put in a caveat. They don't say that X causes Y. That's too strong a statement for an academic, right? And, and understandably, don't get me wrong. Uh, you all know about hypothesis testing. You just you know, cannot start denying things so easily, right? Uh, just because your p-values and stuff like that. But um, the, the, the grandeur causality, right, is, is quite sensible. And there's a whole line of thought that's going around in the way of grandeur causality, which is also quite interesting. I don't mention it much here, um, but uh, let me, does this have a chat box? Let me figure out, there should be a chat box right here. So uh, some of the work that's being done in that area of econometric causality is being done by this guy called Guido Immens and uh, Susan Athi. So if you want to look up references, I'm going to type out some references. The work of Imbens and Athi is quite interesting. Okay? Um, and they have taken the idea for grandeur causality, which is, does the existence of X increase the probability of Y? Again, because in probability theory, we do not have any directionality, right? Uh, it's only about increasing probabilities, increasing and decreasing probabilities. If X happens, the probability of Y falls. If X happens, the probability of Y increases. Right? That's what your most causal uh, theory would work on, right? traditional causal theory, not the probability kind of work. Um, so Immens and Athi are uh, going to be the next husband-wife pair to win the Nobel Prize. Right? I, I predicted uh, ba ba Banerjee and Duflo, uh, they did win the prize. Uh, and we'll come back to Banerjee and Duflo in a little bit. 
Uh, in Bintanati, uh, Susan Atty won the James Clark Bates uh, Medal, uh, given to the best economist under the age of 40. Uh, in Bintanati are doing some fantastic work uh, on causality, very different from the train of thought that I am talking about here. And they're not huge fans of Pearl. Right? I don't know why. There's also the entire literature on advanced time series models, right? VAR models, right? vector autocorrelation models. Uh, conditional heteroscedastic models uh, like Arch and Garch, right? Uh, so Engels and Bollerslev, right? Uh, and Engels for Arch and Bollerslev for Garch. Um, again, stuff that if you are not doing in your uh, coursework, uh, definitely things that you might uh, want to look at, okay? Because econometricians are trying to sort it out in their own way. The challenge is again, uh, most of this work that's happening is about intertemporal probability increase or decrease. Nowhere do I find in the work of Granger, in the work of uh, Imbens and Athi, uh, in the work of Engels, uh, or, or, or uh, in the work of Bollerslev, right, on the Garch models. Uh, they're saying that, look, I have a time series, right? X happens first, Y happens later, given lag, right? Stuff that you know, Arima models, whatever, right? So a little advanced version. Okay, so it's all about intertemporal causality uh, or intertemporal correlation, okay? not moving on to hey causality. But the question then you can tell me is hey, but I can see it, I can see causality, right? I can see X happening, right? And I'm seeing that Y is going up, right? Boom. Okay, X happens, Y goes up. X happens, Y goes up. I see it ten times. It must be true, right? The challenge. Of, uh, you know, thinking like that is the problem of confounders. All of you uh, are doing some uh, kind of data science and, and, and statistics, and all of you know the concept of a confounder. Right? Confounder. Um, you know, uh, so the, the the traditional correlation problem that we looked at uh, is is you know the the sun rises and the cock crows, right? Uh, you know, it happens at the same time, let's say, okay? Uh, now, you, you might say that because the cock crowed, the sun rose. Who knows? Correlation doesn't tell you. There's no directionality in correlation, right? X and Y are happening together. X is correlated to Y. Who cares about the directionality? Wow, fantastic, right? But uh, <clears throat> let's, let's make that problem uh, one, you know, a tad bit more complicated. Let's bring in a third element. Sun rises, cock crows, and uh, the villager wakes up, right? Three things happen together. Now, how can you tell right, using your grandeur causality or using anywhere where you are using traditional probability theory, how can you ever tell that was it the crowing of the cock that woke up the villager or was it the rising of the sun? Maybe uh, if the sun didn't rise, okay, would the villager still wake up at dawn or would he wake up later? Would the cock still crow at dawn if the sun didn't rise? What if it was a solar eclipse? You, can't, you couldn't see the sun, it's covered. Right? What, what, what would happen then? Okay. So the challenge is that we might have multiple things which are highly related to each other, even intertemporally. X is happening, Y is increasing. I keep seeing that. But even when I keep seeing that, the challenge is that both of these, uh, L and B says conduct an experiment. All right, L and B, uh, great point, fantastic point. I will come to that. Good. L I don't know who you are, L and B, but uh, you are correct. Conduct an experiment. Very good. Very good. Fantastic. Right. So good. I'm, I'm getting people to come up with their and and the correct answer. Yes, you you conduct an experiment. Um, so. Uh, even if you have something that happens prior to the event, you don't know that whether there's a third thing, right, which you which, which you cannot see, which causes both of them. I can say that, you know, the cock crows and the villager wakes up. Even if I kill the cock tomorrow, right, the villager would still wake up, right, with sunrise, right? So uh, what's happening is that I have this additional uh, variable K, which is affecting everything, right? And so whenever I have to look for relationships between X and Y, and economists uh, love this word, I control for something, right? 
So I, I, I uh, you know, I control for the cock crowing. So does the does the person does the sunrise cause person to wake up, right? I go and shut the cock's mouth and say, hey, shut up and don't talk today, uh, don't crow. Um, does the person still wake up or not, right? At dawn. Okay. So I control for the crowing. And I control for something else. I'm trying to forecast the GDP here, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I shouldn't talk about GDP. I'll, I'll get uh, I'll start talking about policy, and then we are lost, right? Uh, but um, when you're trying to forecast something like a GDP, uh, the challenge is that, of course, you have multiple linearity, right? That's the biggest challenge when trying to forecast something like this. But the other big challenge is that you have so many confounding elements. And this happens to any macroeconomic prediction that you try to do. Anything that you try to predict, and you say, oh, you know, X causes this, or Y causes this, or X, it, underlying that X lands up being something else, which causes both X1 and X2, right? Uh, or both X and Y, right? Or then you find something underneath that, which causes X1, X2, X3, and Y, right? So, you, you know, unless you drill deeper and deeper and go all the way to the root cause, you wouldn't be able to find what it is. But every time you're going to the root cause, how are you deciding whether that's the root cause? The only way you're deciding it is by saying, oh, it's intertemporal. Both Y and X are being guided by Z, right? Because Z happens before both X and Y, all right? That's the problem about figuring out what your controls should be in, an, in, an, uh, you know, in, a, in a model. And that's the challenge uh, that we face anytime we are doing analysis of any kind, right? We would have all these confounders. Yeah. So, and then this is you telling me boring, right? I don't care about what you're saying. It's complete nonsense. We have ML. Who cares about correlations and regressions, you stupid statistics guy? I mean, I have machine learning. I have the power of the machine. It's gonna learn and tell me everything. All right, great. Okay, you have ML, I understand that. A couple of things, right? Uh, before we we try to forget that yes, this is this can be boring and because statistics. Who cares about statistics and econometrics? I have big data, right? I have three million data points, and I have machine learning to go through the three million data points. Why should I care about econometric models anymore? Yeah, um, Granger causality is dead. Uh, I have random forest support vector machines. Fantastic, very impressive. The problem is uh, that your ML is also based on probability theory. ML also implies likelihood of seeing X if you also see by Y. Uh, it also implies the existence of probability of Y given X when you are saying probability of X given Y. What if that does not exist? Where is my arrow of directionality? Think of a decision tree very basic ML model. And how the ML models that we talk about, they're all based on decision tree, right? You know that, yeah? Your ensemble models and your, uh, I don't know, bagging, boosting, stacking, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all good stuff, don't get me wrong. They're all very interesting things, in interesting, useful things. Um, but if you think of decision tree, right? And, and go back to what you're doing in a decision tree. What you're ultimately doing in a decision tree is just taking a data set, Right? Let's say in, in the case of any industry, right? you're taking a bunch of people and breaking them into smaller and smaller boxes. Right? So male versus female, you look at their default rates. You look at the default rate of the entire box uh, and the male versus female, women do not default as much, males default more. So you've broken the data out into two boxes. Somebody comes in to your uh, bank and uh, you can't see them and they say, hey, I want a loan. What is the probability that they're going to default? You look at history and say 10% of my people default, 10%. Then they say, hey, I'm a man. You look at the man box, right? And the males on an average, let's say, default 12%, 12% chance of default. And then within male, you say renter versus homeowner, right? You look at the homeowners, 7%, uh, renters, 18%. So if the guy says, I am, hi, I want a loan, I am male and I'm a homeowner, uh, you know, again, smaller box for that guy. All you're doing in the process is just getting a bunch of probabilities from your existing data, all right? What about confounders? What about these underlying, underlying variables which you cannot look at? What about intertemporalness, right? What about the time element? Does X, comes, does X always come first before Y? 
right? What about directionality? So your simple decision tree model does not give you that, okay? And, and you can do a lot on top of those decision trees and which is what we do, don't get me wrong. I'm doing this stuff for a living for a long time now. Uh, but anything that you build up over your decision tree, um, you know, your ensemble models, your you know, bagging and boosting and all of that, um, they, they are uh, liable to the same pitfalls. Now you say, oh, okay, you know what? I can run a logistic regression and uh, do an ensemble model based on that. But as we know, correlation is not causation, linear regression is not causation, therefore logistic regression is not causation. So your ensemble model based on your logistic regression also doesn't give you causation. Ha, right? we have AI. So uh, that's the final, the ultimate weapon, right? When I talk about causation, <laughs> all sorts of old stuff, man. I mean, uh, what, what's this nonsense? We have AI, you know, we have artificial neural networks. We have deep learning, right? Um, they named it after me, by the way. I'm kidding, sorry. Uh, it's, it's a stupid joke, I always make that. They named it after me. Um, uh, and, and, and we have CNNs, we have RNNs, and we have XNNs. And X can be, you know, replace it with any letter that you love to use, right? Uh, DNN, BNN, ANN, CNN, XNN, YNN, doesn't matter. So many things. Right, brilliant, so powerful, okay? Now, that brings me to Mr. Pearl, right? And his little picture from his book, okay? So if you, if any of you are, uh, you know, not very mathematically interested or, you know, I wouldn't say oriented, everybody I think is mathematically oriented. They can, you know, it's, it's, it's trivial. Most, most basic mathematics is quite trivial. Uh, I, I, was, I was terrible in math, by the way, used to be. Quite bad, uh, very bad. Um, I still blame my eighth, ninth, and tenth grade maths teachers for that. Right? They didn't teach me well enough. It was their fault, not mine. Uh, 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 but if you are not uh, very interested in getting into the you know, underlying mathematics of it, I'll, I'll refer some books for those as well. Uh, th this is from a book. It's called the Book of Why. Okay, uh, and this is a popular book. Uh, Judea Pearl with uh, Dina. McKinsey. Uh, uh, so if you, uh, so they have a paperback edition. I saw the book with a friend of mine who came from the United States and it was this big tome uh, hardcover book and it was like yeah, 3,000 rupees or something. So I can't buy that. Um, I, 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 of course, uh, thankfully, uh, I, I teach at the you know, US University, which gives me access to their library. Uh, so I had his other technical books, uh, or, uh, you know, the, the, the PDFs of uh, the causal statistics and things like that. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, th this one, thankfully, they came up with the paperbacks. So I I'd love to read that. Um, because especially when I'm trying to explain causality to uh, other people, you know, popular science books always are helpful, right? Free economics and things like that, always good to have uh, and read through. You might just pick up uh, interesting nuggets from there for, for broader audience. So you have AI. Nobody's denying that, right? Now, what does Mr. Pearl say about AI? Professor Pearl say about AI. He says that, you know, there are three things that we do in our mind. We see, we do, and we imagine, okay? Seeing or observing, right? Which is at the bottom of the ladder, the ladder of causality. The question that I can ask is what if I see this? That means how are variables related? If I see X, is, am I increasing the chance of seeing Y, right? What does a particular symptom tell me about a disease? What does a survey tell us about the election results? Association rules. All of you have worked on market basket analysis. All of you have worked on with artificial neural networks. Whenever you're recalibrating weights in your neural net, right, what are you doing? Ultimately, if you break it down to your bare to its bare bones, the way you're updating your weights in a neural network, it's something that can be used and done in Excel using a solver. Right. So uh, Madhukar, who has already spoken here, I guess, uh, and, and uh, my colleague Gunwan Singh, uh, Gunwant is uh, faculty at Jigsaw, and uh, you know, one of the, I, I think, bar none, one of the best uh, teachers of neural networks. It's so simple, beautiful. Right. I saw his video. I was like, man, and, and he's like, I don't know, 30 years old or something. It's so smart. Um, so uh, if you, he, he broke it down into an Excel file. Okay. Gunwan Singh would just have an Excel file and you're looking at a multi-layer perceptron uh, using an Excel file, the weights are getting updated, right? Really neat. Um, 
how can you do it in Excel? The, the reason why even Excel would do it, and nothing against Excel, I use it all the time, or or any because all we are doing, or a large chunks of what we're doing, don't. I'm not trying to undermine the linear algebra and the optimization and the probability theory behind deep learning. Okay, don't don't get me wrong. I think it's extremely valuable, but at the end of the day, all we are doing is figuring out association rules. Right? Are x and y observed together? Are they associated with each other? According to Pearl, and this is something that I truly believe in, uh, even before I read his work, um, these are all association rules and they're at the bottom rung of causality. Okay, absolutely at the bottom. This is the Nietzsche, right? Um, because what we really want or what we as human beings think is about intervention. We just don't think about association. If X, then Y, if Y, then X, if X1, X2, then Y, right? That's what all my decision trees and AI is doing right now. What about intervention? What if I do this? What if I, uh, you know, punch the guy in the face, okay? Uh, I, I, I might have a lot of historical priors, but whenever I'm thinking about doing something or intervening, what would Y be if I do X? These are, often questions that are much, much more difficult to understand. A baby understands it, right? Uh, it's a little beyond animal thinking. Um, my, my dog probably doesn't understand what is the potential effect of an intervention, right? Uh, but a human being does, even a human baby does, right? Uh, animals understand association rules, they do. You give the dog the treat every time he shakes his hand or every time he sits when you tell him to, you know, they understand association rules fantastically well. Okay. Um, intervention, nearly impossible for an animal to understand. Human beings then move on to the third rung of causality, which is, you know, we are nowhere close to that, right? And that's counterfactuals. What if, right, Kennedy had not died? What if, uh, you know, Narendra Modi was not the prime minister, right? Uh, would we still see a 23% drop in the GDP or not? I, now, I don't know the answer, by the way. And, 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 and I'm not uh, making a political statement here at all. It doesn't matter who the prime minister is, right? It's completely relevant to this question. But what I'm trying to say is that as a human being, we're always talking about counterfactuals all the time. You know, Sachin shouldn't have hit, hit, hit whatever his, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know any not too much of a phrase, his square cut, right? It was not, you know, he shouldn't have done that. He should have blocked that ball. That's the kind of stuff that we are talking about all the time because we can imagine, right? Imagination, right? Which allows us to think about counterfactuals. That's something that did not happen. I should be able to figure out that what would happen if it did happen. If Gandhi was not shot, right? If Gandhiji was not shot, then what would happen, right? How would our country be different? Again, these are the kind of speculations that a human mind can take care of. And artificial intelligence is very, very, very far away from that, which is why, you know, AI doesn't uh, come up with startup ideas yet. Because AI, according to Pearl, and, and something that I kind of believe in, is at the bottom rung of the ladder of causality. It only looks at association, right? Okay. Question then from you guys, right? All, 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 the, all the things on top, that's your question to me. I'm just uh, trying to predict what your next question is. What about Bayes, right? The good Reverend Thomas Bayes. You know Bayes theorem, right? Conditional probability, Bayes theorem, love that stuff. Right? Um, if you have not read uh, the work of, uh, and, and, and this guy is not really, uh, you know, doing any new academic work, right? It's, it's not. But uh, if you have not seen the work of Nate Silver, uh, please go ahead and see it. He is, you know, uh, he had a book called Signal and the Noise, The Signal and the Noise, right? Okay. So Nate Silver uh, is a Bayesian, uh, and uh, he started a site where he started predicting baseball matches, okay, using Bayesian inferencing, just base. Uh, and then uh, he figured out that the mathematics of uh, predicting, uh, you know, uh, baseball matches is fairly similar. To the mathematics of predicting elections. So he started predicting elections. And uh, Silver historically has been the most successful election predictor in the world, uh, definitely in the United States, where every time, time and again, 
he would use uh, Bayesian updating, updating techniques, which are very easy, right? You guys know, I mean, basic Bayes rule, how difficult is that? Um, quite trivial. Um, but he uses Bayesian updating techniques, right? Based on the data that comes from surveys and expert opinions and polls, and he just keeps updating it. He has n amount of information, gets n plus one, net survey, updates it, updates it. And, and this guy has been calling every election correctly, right? I mean, 51 states, uh, you know, 50 states plus, oh, I don't know, whatever, 51, 50, 51 states, all of them, right? Uh, and and, and he's, he's a pure Bayesian. Okay. So do read a little bit. I mean, the, the book's quite interesting. Again, there's a paperback which is available in India, so it shouldn't be very expensive to buy. And I'm sure there's an ebook. I keep talking about hard copy books as if they're essential. Most of you guys are probably reading it on your Kindle or your iPad, right? So Bayes tells us about conditional probability. What about probability of A given B? Right? Uh, now that's uh, that's pretty much what we are what we are talking about when we are saying causality, right? That what happens to A, the likelihood of A, given that B has happened. Okay, so that's that's easy manageable. And then what we did, and, and this is again an early contribution of Pearl and others, right? It's not just one person does all this, is to take these, take this Bayes theorem and kind of generalize it a little bit, right? To move it to kind of what we call Bayesian networks. That if there are multiple X's that affect your Y, right? uh, you, what, what can you do, right? You can create a network, very simple, okay? Um, and, and I, I know that uh, Saurabh teaches you guys Bayesian networks and Bayesian belief networks, uh, very, very interesting. And so you're already in the right direction. Right? Um, and and uh, simply, you know that uh, a Bayesian network is nothing more uh, than, than Bayes rule, right? Uh, which uh, we saw right here, right? Uh, and, and then Bayes rule over and over and over again. And the way the message from the first base rule or first use of base rule to the second use and to the third use and so on gets passed around is by what we call a message passing algorithm. The easiest way to think about it is a Markov compatible chain. Right? So uh, you guys probably already know that, but nothing that is very earth shatteringly new or difficult. Uh, 80s research. Uh, the Bayesian network stuff is now being extensively used in many different things, including telecom, right? how uh, you know, signals get uh, passed on and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and so what we, are, what we have with the Bayesian network is we have a chain of probabilistic inferencing, okay? Um, remember the use of the word probabilistic inferencing as opposed to not, not causal inferencing. Um, often with time order, directional order. So that's meeting some of the criteria of Suser, right? But it's still not causal inferencing. And, and, and the reason why I need causal inferencing is this guy. The first or one of the most important reason why we need a new structure for probability theory. We don't have it. We don't have causality in probabilities. It just doesn't exist in that, that, that calculus, in that algebra, whatever you want to call it. Right? The challenge is whenever I am creating a Bayesian network, okay, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, Bayesian networks is absolutely straight in the right direction, okay? Uh, whenever I'm creating a Bayesian belief network, right? Or whenever I'm creating a machine learning algorithm, at the end of the day, what am I doing? You know, oh, I, you know, Y being predicted by X1, X2, X3, X3, X5, X7. I have big data, 3000 columns, X3000. Uh, you know, ultimately, what am I doing at the bottom of it? What I'm doing is calculating joint probabilities. Any ML model that you can think of, it doesn't matter whether you're neural networks or whatever. So what happens when I am trying to run a Bayesian network or ML model without thinking about causality, right? Is that as my X, Xs increase, this calculation of the joint probability distribution is just gonna boom, explode. Too many of them, okay? That's my biggest challenge of trying to understand joint probability distributions. Right. So enter Pearl. Pearl says, okay, great. We already have. And then this guy is, I mean, he is the one who really made this whole Bayesian thing popular, right? I mean, he, he came up with a lot of the research and made it happen. But now he goes back, and this is this is why that you know, I, I think he's kind of a you know, amazing academic in some ways. 
right? That he goes back to Bayesian networks and figures out what are the challenges in a Bayesian network? What, what are the things that are kind of, uh, you know, can be optimized out of a Bayesian network? Okay. A Bayesian network, as you already know, is a directional acyclical graph, right? A diagram. Uh, the causal diagrams, which we will see in the next few minutes, uh, are also very, very similar to path diagrams. Uh, they are basically DAGs as well, right? But with one additional element, which is the element of causality. And I'll, I'll tell you what the difference is and why, they, why we need that difference. There, so there's a graph way of doing it and the, the diagrammatic way. And Paul is a huge fan of these diagrams. He's like, you know, forget the math if you don't want to do it. It's not as important. He says that the diagrams are more important than the map. Okay. And he says that over and over again. I mean, you read any of his, you know, uh, statistics for causal inferencing or whatever. I mean, you read any of his books, he keeps harping about the diagram. Uh, part of that, I think, comes from, uh, you know, the original work of Seawall Wright, uh, who was the first person, even though he was a sociologist, he loved working with guinea pigs. Uh, and and uh, he was one of the first people to show that how the genetic get up of the parents of a guinea pig, right, uh, would affect the outcome in a child, right? So in his case, he looked at colors, right? So uh, it's a white guinea pig, a brown guinea pig, one with patches, right? And he figured out what's the likelihood that the child, right, based on directional arrows or causal diagrams, okay? So you should, you know, if you look at the book of why, it, it shows, you know, tells you the story very neatly, it shows you the diagrams and, and pictures of guinea pigs, very sweet. Uh, <laughs> um, but you, you look at those causal diagrams, right? And that's enough because see, once you have created the DAG, calculating probabilities from that DAG or likelihoods from that DAG is fairly easy, right? It's a trivial solution, okay? Uh, you, can, you can just create a table and calculate it. You can get a small optimizer to run it. But you have to have that path diagram very clearly mentioned and the likelihoods mentioned. Once you have that, quite simple. Okay. Um, the second uh, potential way of doing it is, of course, the math. Right? And here is, again, the other key contribution of Perl and, and his colleagues, which is the do-y algebra, right? the do algebra, ata, what we call the, uh, the causal calculus. This is effectively a nonlinear structural equation model. Uh, I am not sure if you guys are taught structural equation models in class. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know that I don't teach structural equation models in my class. Um, so, uh, but uh, structural equation models are uh, very important. I'll talk about them a little bit more in, in the next uh, a few slides. Uh, but structural equation models kind of allow you to do certain things which uh, traditional statistical or uh, algorithms, uh, statistical models are, uh, you know, uh, machine learning algorithms won't let you do. Okay. So if you are interested, Sarab says no. Uh, so uh, if you are interested, I would urge you some uh, yeah, references, of course. Uh, see, see, uh, more new things, sorry about that. I'll, I'll keep saying, talking about things which are so obscure, nobody wants to know about them, right? So maybe it's all junk, right? You're, you're filling your head with two hours of junk or one and a half hours of junk. Uh, but if I have piqued your interest, then do look at structural equation models. They can be quite useful, and I'll tell you why in a bit, right? It's structural equation modeling, which is not new, right? Uh, Nonlinear versions of structural equation modeling with a little twist. And the little twist is the do algebra. So now, before I go to Bayesian DAGs to causal diagrams and so on, uh, let me, uh, oh, there we go. No, it, I have it. I was not sure if there's the do algebra. I'm, I'm looking for, uh, for uh, the probability the new probability structure that I'm talking about. So with, with causal inferencing, the way I'm changing my Bayesian DAG, right? Uh, so this is uh, you know, a standard uh, picture, right? A directional, directional cyclical graph in the Bayesian format, right? So this is stuff that you have seen before. Um, uh, the, the example, uh, and, and this comes from one of Pearl's books. I don't know, I, I keep reading them simultaneously, so I don't know which one. It's not, it's one of the more technical books. And uh, of course, this wouldn't <laughs> be in the popular science book. Uh, but uh, basically, you know, what, what, what he's saying is that, look, this is what a causal diagram or a Bayesian network looks like, right? You have a particular season, right? In that season, sprinklers might be on or it might rain. Both of these lead to wet roads. And wet roads always lead, lead to slippery uh, 
or wet wet pavements, uh, which leads to slippery pavements. So my point is, I want to avoid slippery pavements, right? Because I don't know. I have a dog which is growing at the speed of light. If I go walking with him on a slippery pavement, I know I'm going to break my neck. Right? Um, so here I have these arrows from Xi to Xj, and it provides the details of the relationship based on the simple concept of a Markovian parent. That again, either you know or I can share with you. Uh, I have a hidden slide somewhere about Markovian parents, and you want to bother everybody about that. Now. Once I have this kind of a diagram, when calculating joint probabilities, we'll use the chain rule, of course, right? So you all know the chain rule. So my probability of x1, x2, x3, x4, etc., is a multiplicand of xj given the rest. So if I have to calculate in this particular example, because there are five x's, I have probability of x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5. First, I calculate the probability of x1. Uh, multiply that by probability x2 given x1, then x3 given x1, then x4 given x2, x3, x5 given x4, etc., etc. Right? Simple chain rule. Now, if I instead used a causal diagram, and I'm going to show you a causal diagram right, right after this, right? Another small example, very, very funny example. It's kind of a little worrisome because uh, Pearl uh, is from Israel, right? He lives in Israel, uh, which has a lot of. Uh, history of military stuff, right? Um, again, no political comment here, uh, but a lot of military. Everybody has to serve in the army for three years, right? Everyone in Israel. Uh, you, you meet some of them traveling in India uh, after their uh, work with the army. Um, so the next one is a little sinister in, in that way. Uh, however, uh, the, the way causality or causal diagrams can help here is that if I knew that my sprinkler will be on, Right? And it won't depend on the season. My sprinkler will be on. I could have chopped off one arm here, right? This x1 to x3, just by defining one causal element. If I had done that, what I see here, right, would have gone down significantly. My chain rule, I'm still maybe using the chain rule, but my chain rule just becomes much smaller. Because what I have done is from a simple Bayesian network, which I know about. I am changing only one element of it, saying that x1 doesn't cause x3. x3 is on its own, right? So I just get rid of this guy. So what it does is, even when I'm using my chain rule, this whole thing becomes significantly simplified. I'm going to show you an example right here. Uh, Dags and deseparation criteria, I'm not going in there, but I'm guessing that all of you, or many of you know uh, what the deseparation is. Is. But let's go to causal diagrams, right? Um, simple example, but let's see what it can do. This is, again, uh, very, very uh, easy to understand. So, prisoner X might be shot at the firing squad. Right? Bad stuff, right? Now, uh, the court has to send an order to the captain uh, saying that, yes, shoot the guy. Uh, the captain has two shooters who are going to stand in the firing squad and uh, shoot prisoner X and A and B, right? And when they shoot, they're, they're really good. They don't miss. So the person's going to die. Now, what I have done with this story here, and I have not, Pearl did it for me, is that he has drawn a causal diagram. This is a causal diagram. Okay. Now, <clears throat> why is this causal diagram important? It looks like a simple picture, man. I could have drawn it. To, <laughs> you know, I can teach my 10-year-old. I, I don't have but if I had it, if, if I know a 10 year old, I can teach a 10 year old this, right? That's uh, pretty uh, uh, basic stuff, right? The beauty of this causal diagram is that it can answer questions in all three rungs of the ladder of causality, not just association. It can answer association questions. So, question one if D, that means if the person died, what is the probability that the court gave an order to shoot? Right? That's the kind of that question that we answer. Right? We see D. We don't, we, don't, we don't know the underlying causes of it. We see the outcome, and we say that probability of outcome given whatever comes before, or probability of whatever comes before, given that, what's the probability of outcome at the end? So I, we see the outcome when we're looking at statistical models. We are looking at the outcome. 
And we're trying to figure out what led to that outcome. Okay, so I'm trying to figure out the X's. So that's the association question. This is stuff that your statistical models also tell you all that. Now, I move on to the next layer or the next level of my ladder of causality. That if A shoots without being asked, so nobody told A that, hey, go shoot the prisoner. I don't know, crazy guy just decides to shoot. What is the probability of death? The diagram can answer me very easily. If D, then what is P of CL? If I get to this point of death, I can calculate backwards and say, of course, there was a court order. Of course, this is a very simple example, all binary outcomes, right? Secondly, if A shoots without being asked, so there's an intervention here. It's going from beyond association to intervention. What is the probability of death? We can answer that question because we know that if A shoots, this is what happens. Third question, what if A had not shot, even if ordered, would the prisoner be still alive? This is a counterfactual. What would have happened if this had happened? Right? This is a world that doesn't exist. Right? This is a, a world which is in my mind of causality. So the third question is a counterfactual. But my, um, my diagram, because it lays down all the relationships from a cause and effect perspective, it'll say that if A had sh not shot even if, or if ordered, B would have shot as well, absolutely. So if there was an order and A said, no, I am not gonna shoot this guy. I think he's a, he's a good dude. I don't wanna shoot him. This guy would have still died, right? X would have still died. Why? Because B would have shot. Okay, so in an counterfactual world, which does not really exist, uh, you should be able to answer all the questions using a causal diagram, right? So that's that's kind of, and without calculating joint probability distributions, no joint probability is needed, okay? All right, now comes the causal algebra. What, 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 is, what is it that Pearl is proposing? How is he planning to do things differently? Okay, um, I wish I'd put up the white, put up the whiteboard, but this is called the do-why method of representing probabilities. Uh, what if the captain may ask to, what if the captain may ask, right, uh, both of his people? Absolutely. So all you need to do from something like this, if there's a may involved, right, instead of a binary decision, you give it probabilities, right? Just existing probabilities. As long as you do probabilities with directions. I don't have a problem with probabilities at all. Right? This is binary. I don't care about that, right? Instead of binary, uh, I say, okay, uh, a is going to listen to the boss with a probability of X or whatever, uh, and B is going to listen to the boss with a probability of Y. Right? Um, as long as I provide the directional arrow there, okay, I can still answer the question of what's going to happen as a counterfactual even. Right? This is very similar, if you think about it, Partha, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very similar to, uh, it, and that, that's because I, I think about economics all the time, right? in some ways or the other, uh, and, and game theory especially. This is uh, kind of a, uh, you know, a, a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. It's very similar to mixed strategy Nash. You don't need uh, actual events or potential events. You can actually have probabilities, but you can still calculate the mixed strategy equilibrium. I hope that answers So, question. All right, so the causal algebra, getting back to it. There's only one change that, that um, you know, uh, th this guy, uh, Pearl and, and his co-authors are making when they're talking about changing the way we do probabilities versus, um, versus doing probabilities from a causal standpoint. Okay. And that is fairly simple. It's not uh, earth shatteringly difficult. All he's saying is that, look, probability of L given D says that probability of increasing lifespan given that he or she took the medicine. But there's no directional arrow. That did D lead to L or not? Doesn't tell me. It says, I saw the probability of L given D. Right? How, how, what, is, what is the likelihood of L happening given that somebody took the medicine? Um, all we are adding to that 
is this one term called do, right? which is why it's called the do y method. Okay. So probability of L do D, what am I doing? We are adding direction. Right? We're adding direction and saying that, look, if he or she did do this, right? where, that, where did that lead back to? And you can think of this problem from uh, you know, things like setting toothpastes, right? If price is X, right? Not that what are the probabilities, but if X, or if we did X, if I change the price of the toothpaste, right? what happened to the sales? Right? So instead of taking, uh, you know, instead of doing anything else, what I'm doing is I am doing, uh, I'm providing a directionality that only if X is done, right, then what happens to L? This kind of calculations, when you're doing it in, in, in more complex situations, showing you very toy models, can be done right, by nonlinear structural equation models. The problem of why this L given D, uh, Sarthi asks, in this case, how does one rule out correlation without control groups and how would you account for confounders without assuming that your sampling eliminates the bias effectively? Very, very good question. And again, what I'm seeing here is you guys are coming up with the answers to the questions that I am asking. So uh, we will get to control groups in like five minutes. Okay, so that 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 should be a good thing. That should be our answer to your question, right? Okay, so the the beauty of a structural equation model, right? And again, when you're drawing it, doing a structural equation model, it uh, uh, you know it allows you to build such nice pictures. The, what, the, what the structural equation model does is it looks very much like uh, you know, some of the statistical models that you have learned. Right? It doesn't look very, very different. It's kind of a bunch of equations. Right? Um, the only thing that I am, uh, you know, the, the only reason why structural equation models can help you right? or, or add on to what you're doing is because of latent variables or confounders. So they're very similar to the traditional method of statistics that you've learned with a small twist that it helps understand the patterns and covariate variances among a set of variables, right, which are internally related to each other. And it explains as much of the variance as possible with this particular specified model. Okay, So this is a list of your difference between your traditional econometric models, right, uh, or, or you, know, you can call them machine learning models, they're very, very close, versus a, a structural equation model. The biggest change or, or distinction here is that firstly, the ACM is quite flexible. Any of the traditional models that you have looked at, right, can be subsumed in a structural equation model. Okay, so your linear or logistic regression, it doesn't mean that you cannot run linear type or logistic type regression models with structural equation models, you can, right? It has the flexibility, uh, okay, to take and subsume all of these methods. Structural equation models, and this is where the problem comes. Why don't we see a bunch of libraries on causal models? This is the question that you were probably already asking yourself that, okay, if this stuff was so cool, right? Why don't we see 20 different kinds of, you know, uh, libraries, uh, logistic regression with the do I, uh, uh, you know, probability calculus, a linear regression with the do I probability calculus. We can do that. Why don't we see that? The reason why we don't see that is that in, in uh, structural equation models, there's no default model. There is no, hey, here are my x's, here's my y, start you know, uh, looking at uh, my, my support vector machines and uh, figuring out, you know, start looking at my neural nets and figuring out the weights. Structural equation models without fail require a formal specification of the model that has to be estimated and that formal specification has to be provided by the user challenge is that that does not allow us to plug and chug our models. We are all about taking a library, plug it in, boom, there's the output and I'm going to look at it. All right. Stru another, uh, it, it, the, the beauty of structural equation models is that it resolves problems of multicollinearity. Um, because whenever you have these unobserved variables, right, they will provide you with this whole construct of a latent variable. So 
I cannot possibly have multicollinearity because if I have two x's which are correlated to each other, I know that underlying those x1 and x2, there's another latent variable which I cannot see, which affects both x1 and x2, right? So the moment you run a structural uh, equation model, by, uh, you know, by definition, you're taking away the problem of multicollinearity and thus confounding, and thus the biggest challenge, one of the biggest challenges that I was talking about of traditional modeling as we see it. All right. So uh, spend a little bit of time uh, on this, yeah. So Sarthi, to answer your question, if you go to applications of the of, of structural equation models, if you go to applications of causal analytics, causal analysis, the holy grail of causality today are randomized control trials. All of you have heard of randomized control trials, right? I, I think my mom has heard, heard of randomized control trials now. Why? Because uh, you know, uh, Banerjee, Duflo, and Kramer uh, won the Nobel Prize. So everybody in India heard about <laughs> you know, that uh, uh, challenge. Uh, of course, uh, the beauty of the challenge, as you mentioned, Sarthi, is that this requires a control group. There has to be a control group. If you do not have a control group, what are you going to compare it against? Thus, it is not just an algorithmic process which is essential to implement the do y algorithm, right? Or, or, the, or the probability theory with the do little do attached to it. But you need a control group, which is very similar in behavior where that do is not done, right? So you wanna, you wanna do that, uh, you can think of in, you know, in, in medicine, of course, uh, but even if you're thinking of pricing strategies, similar groups, Right? In one, you do change the price. In the other, you do not. Right? So you need a control group. Problem is that, how the hell am I going to get a control group? Right? Um, but if you can, right? if you are working on a problem, you're A-B testing something, you are uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, pricing things, you're thinking of the color of your Facebook page or whatever have you, uh, I would urge you strongly to look at Box Banken or any of these classic, uh, you know, papers and books on experimental design. One of the biggest things that we miss out, right, on as data scientists, even when we can, right, very often we cannot, right? Data is just thrown at us. There's no design to it. There's stuff that happened, right? Um, is that even when we can run experiments? We don't design them the correct way. Right? Uh, so you are A/B testing your website. You are thinking about pricing. You are thinking about hiring. You are thinking about. I mean, there are so many, many ways right, or places where we can use randomized control trials in small doses. Right? Uh, the core of which is doing solid experimental design. The unfortunate part is that we do not do solid experimental design even when we can. So next time you're working for an e-commerce site, right, remember that that's one area. Anything that's kind of fast moving right, uh, and within your control that you can make changes uh, or collect data, you have the choice to collect data and the data comes quickly enough that you can analyze it on the fly. Um, make sure that you read up a little bit about experimental design to ensure right, that you can perform a randomized control trial where you can potentially use right, your do I version of probability theory, that it only happens, right, L given do X, right, if X is not done with the same group, what happens to L, if X is done with the same group, what happens to X, right? Okay, so all this nonsense that I talked about, where the hell is the library or where the whatever bleep is the library, because, you know, the moot point, we're all applied data scientists, we don't have time for this nonsense. Thanks for talking about, you know, do why and showing us Markov chains. I don't give a damn. Where is my library? Uh, I was writing something in Python back in the days. Uh, thankfully, someone else did my job, the Microsoft research team, right? Uh, I, 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 you know, it, it interests me beyond the point that I actually started coding a little bit of, uh, of uh, sp spending some time and uh, trying to figure out how to write this stuff in output Python. Um, so here's a link. Uh, there's a package in Python <laughs> now uh, called Do uh, This is from the Microsoft research, research team, Sharma Kichiman et al. Um, and here's the link. So it's there. Uh, 
Uh, and here's the getting started with the do why, right? Uh, this simple example. Uh, take a look at that. Uh, it's it's stuff that's quite intuitive uh, and and flows directly from what I am talk what I've been talking about. So that's what it leads to. That, but again, your challenge is what's my biggest challenge when I'm trying to do this whole do why type of algebra. Right? Again, not in the causal diagrams. That's the beauty of the causal diagrams, right? That you can still get to probabilities without having the do part, right? Very clearly defined. But the moment you're bringing in a mathematical construct like a structural equation model, right? Your biggest challenge would be that where am I going to get this kind of data? So if you guys wanted a library, I'm providing you a library. So please go ahead and try to play around with it. I think it can give you something uh, a new um, kind of uh, new way of looking at uh, this particular type of problem. Okay. Now, question: But what if I cannot do RCTs? I mean, uh, look, uh, uh, Banerjee and Duflo run JPL, right? Uh, and, and all of, a lot of you guys must know about JPL. Uh, and and the J uh, of that JPL is Jamal, right? So it's Jamal Poverty Action Lab. Uh, it's named after Abdul Latif Jamal, who gave them a hundred million dollars. Right, or something like that. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's 50 more. Maybe it's 150. I don't know. Um, and, and, and what they could do with RCTs, right, is they, they would take RCTs and do it in entire villages. So there's so many beautiful stories about, you know, deworming in Nigeria and, and school attendance in India and stuff like that. They look at two different villages. In one, they would run very similar villages in similar areas. In one, they would run the study and in the other, they would not. Right? And then uh, you can easily put that in a do I calculus, right? And get an outcome. Now, this is again a good way of thinking about your research that if there is available RCT data, can you can you, you know, because Banerjee at all, they're they're definitely they're using structural equation models that they're not definitely not using the uh, do calculus uh, as as Carl has defined it. Right. So good research idea might be, and if and if you are researchers or or intend to do some research, might be to get some RCT data. And try to lay it out in the format of uh, of, of the do calculus, and then try to figure out that how that the, the directional arrow, right, actually makes the changes, okay, and create some causal diagrams. I think that's an interesting paper which can be published in a, in a tier seven journal. But whatever, I I would find it interesting to do. But what if I cannot do RCTs and I don't have a hundred million dollars like uh, Abhijit Banerjee? Right? I mean, don't get me wrong, they do fantastic work. Uh, I think his work on their work on our, his work on RCTs or their work on RCTs are not that new uh, or surprising. What I find, uh, I, I find Banerjee's work on herd behavior much more interesting and Duflo's work on the dams paper. I mean, if you have read the paper on dams, brilliant. That why, in, and this is the Indian data. So if you are interested, um, Esther Duflo uh, with a co author, I forget her name. Uh, uh, has a paper uh, in the American Economic Review. I think it's called DAMS. If you have not read it and you want to see what data can do, right? Uh, small data, not large data. You should read it. It's it's mind-boggling. I mean, that that's Nobel worthy, right? Even if she had not done a single RCT in her life, uh, give her the prize. Okay, I mean, <laughs> uh, but the point is that without controls, right? My my do why calculus goes for a toss. Scientific experimentations, yes, based on controls. A-B testing, if designed correctly, absolutely. But what about, so economists love natural experiments, right? Suddenly a law gets introduced, how did things change? Suddenly, uh, you know, COVID happened, how did things change? They'll look at the history and try to figure out what the changes were like, right? And that's kind of what the do calculus can do, right? Even in what we call naturally occurring experiments, right? A law suddenly changes the behavior of people. That's called a naturally, naturally occurring experiment. Right. That's the kind of stuff that economists love and, uh, you know, of course, stuff that you can do, and do a lot of things with. Now, that is the limitation of my causal inferencing process. Right? So in that case, is all lost? Can I not use causality or understand causality uh, if I do not have randomized control data uh, or, or experimental data? Uh, I will argue as a next step, I don't know how, what time we're at. Um, 
I'm sure I've overshot the time uh, margin, uh, but I'll argue that yes, there are uh, things that we can do. Okay. Um, I'm gonna spend uh, maybe uh, the next 10 minutes. Uh, I, you know, and, uh, or if you guys wanna ask questions now, or do you wanna, uh, so how, do you, how do you usually do this? I mean, questions now, questions later? Um, as, they you, come. So, um, as they come, uh, you know, okay. yeah. so, okay. Right. So you've been looking at the uh, questions anyway and kind of answer. Chat box, yeah. That's great, carry on please. Okay, um, so what if I cannot do RCTs? Look, uh, that's and that's what I love about interdisciplinary research, right? And, uh, you know, and I, the challenge is that everybody is doing interdisciplinary research. Every idiot. Uh, I learned some little thing from uh, ML, right? And I'm like, oh, you know, I want to use it in marketing. Or I learn a little bit of marketing from somewhere and I use the technique in, I don't know, epidemiology. And I think I'm a genius, right? <laughs> that's a challenge with multidisciplinary research. But I think that uh, you know, to be a good data scientist, Today, right? uh, you need to understand the machine learning and algorithm and all the stuff that you're learning. Uh, I, I would I would strongly recommend uh, learning structural equations. Right? Uh, you guys are already a step ahead because you understand Bayesian networks, right? So causal diagrams and uh, causal networks would be easier for you guys. Um, just the next step would be structural equations. Uh, understand the do why uh, way of uh, doing probabilities, right? Which which Pearl uh, brings up simply by adding a single extra term, right? Uh, you can you can just extract so much out of your data, but that's not that's not the end, right? Uh, ML and e economics are or, or econometrics are not the only things that can give you insights. Okay? Uh, and and, uh, and, and uh, so what I spend my time on, along with those, all of this stuff, is uh, I, I you know work with quantitative psychology. So I'm gonna, I, I told Sarah, I'm gonna do a little plug of a couple of things that I'm interested in. If your students get interested, they should get in touch with me. Uh, or if they want to write papers, I don't know. Uh, the only true legend, right, is Herb Simon, right? Forget about everybody else you learned about. I mean, Andy New and stuff, I mean, great guy, don't get me wrong. Uh, doesn't hold a candle to Herb Simon. Herb Simon is the father of behavioral economics and the father of AI, too, right? Uh, two amazing kids, right? Has <laughs> given birth to uh, one. One is AI and one is behavioral economics. Change the world, right? He won the Nobel in economics and won the Turing Award for this work on AI. Right? Only person in the world, I think, has done both. I'm not sure, but I think so. Okay. Uh, what have you not heard? Why have you not heard of Herb Simon? The reason why you not heard of Herb Simon is why he did fantastic work. A lot of his ideas on behavioral economics and in AI just fell out of fashion. People stopped talking about it. Okay, the return of Simon, Simon Gott, uh, Avtar, new Avtar, uh, Gerd Gigerens or Max Planck Institute. What Gerd says uh, is very, very opposite to the work that became very popular, which is the work of Daniel Kahneman. Uh, Daniel Kahneman is a well-known Princeton economist uh, who uh, won the Nobel Prize. In, uh, he's a psychologist who won the Nobel Prize in economics. Uh, he wrote a book uh, called uh, recently, Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, which kind of, uh, takes the extract of all his work um, and, and puts it in a single book. It's a tome, but worth reading. Uh, and, and of course, Richard Taylor, uh, who, who also won the Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, I, th I think he's, <laughs> he, he's more of a journalist, I think. But anyway, I shouldn't be saying this. Right? Shit. You're not putting it up on YouTube, right? No. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, anyway, Taylor doesn't know who I am. So good. That's great. Good thing. Of course we are. <laughs> Too, too small. No, Taylor doesn't know who I am. I'll never meet the guy. Uh, but I, I think uh, what these guys have done, Kahneman and Taylor and these guys, their work is all about building stories about how human beings behave. That human beings are not rational and all of that. That's great work because what, ha what that has done is taken traditional econometric theory or statistics or all, all these things, right? We, I, we think about human learning and added an uh, element of psychology to it. That human beings are not rational. Now, any moron on the street could have told you that human beings are not rational, but the economists and the policymakers of the world do not know that human beings are not rational. They still think that human beings are rational. Uh, thanks to Kahneman and Taylor, that, that's, that, that, that stupidity is gone, right? Or mostly gone, or going away at least. Uh, but the problem with the Kahneman-Taylor kind of work is that it's unquantifiable. No numbers, it's all about stories. Right? You have anchoring, you anchor to a certain thing that you see, you, you have representativeness bias, 
a lot of small numbers, right? All these biases and stuff, very important. You can't quantify them. Gigerenzer uh, and, and, and Kahneman also says that all of these things make us stupid, right? Uh, when, we, when we use heuristics or mental shortcuts, what Kahneman is forgetting is that if we did not use mental shortcuts, we wouldn't be able to cross the street. Nobody's do, sitting and doing vector calculus to understand the speed of the car, which is, you know, that which the car is coming and the, and the wind speed that's coming and therefore where the car would be based on the lights and the dog that's gonna run in the street. Who's doing that calculus, man? Maybe Kahneman is, I mean, I'm not. So it's, it's not stupid. I think heuristics actually make us quite smart and allowed us, has allowed us to survive. This is the kind of thinking that Herb Simon came up with and Giger Enzer uh, uh, with uh, Daniel Goldstein. Uh, wrote a book called Simon, Simple Heuristics That Make Us Smart. Uh, read it. I mean, there is an alternative. So more new names, sorry about that. And if any of your PhD students, by the way, uh, the Winter School in Bounded Rationality, uh, they, they, so Gigerenzer and his group had a summer school in Bounded Rationality in Berlin. Uh, it's free, they pay for your flight tickets. Um, I attended it when I was a PhD student. Uh, brilliant, right? The great thing is uh, now they have one in, uh, in India. Uh, and because of uh, the funding from Harding, uh, uh, Raj Shetty is one of the thousand people who are doing great work on behavioral economics. Yeah, but he's good. He's good. Don't get me wrong. It's again, uh, uh, great, great stuff. Yeah. Um, but uh, but uh, you know the, the problem with the work that Chetty is doing, or a lot of these guys are doing, is um, as I said they they think of. Uh, this whole train of behavioral economics that's been done by Kahneman et al. is kind of the holy grail, which it is not. Like it's not, it's not even close to that. Uh, what I find much more interesting, and, and don't get me wrong, I've read a lot about the Kahneman stuff. I've, I've written stuff based on that as well. Um, but is the work that Gerd and Peter Todd or Daniel Goldstein uh, and a whole bunch of other researchers are doing is that they are taking uh, decision sciences and, and, and kind of bringing it together with the way we think about data science, which is predictability. They're breaking up. No economist, what they're solved is splitting up their data into train and test sets. No economist does that, by the way, like idiots. Uh, but uh, no psychologist does that too. They don't have big size data. This work. It's a tiny data set. These guys are actually trying to do predictions. They're saying that estimates are important. My R squared is important, but what I really care about is predictions. My research, what I find interesting, and what I'm working on now, is to take, uh, sorry, it's a alarm. Uh, what I find interesting now uh, is how can we take heuristics from human learning and intelligence to machine learning and artificial intelligence? So that's, that's what uh, I'm working on right now. Um, the problem is that you need to understand kind of both fields. Uh, so you know, and I'm, I'm not that smart. Um, and and uh, and, but, but there's, I think, a lot of overlap, uh, and a lot of things, because the neural networks that we have designed, right, historically that we have seen, they are trying to emulate the physiological neural network structure. Whereas uh, what uh, some people are uh, trying to propagate is that I don't want a machine to behave like a neuron. I want a machine to behave like a human being. And a human being is uh, you know, the structure or the way a human being thinks is not rational and it's not just single processing. Right? It is single processing, yes, but but the way we get from inputs to outputs, uh, uh, we don't need to emulate that process, that physiological process. Right? If you can actually emulate the psychological process, I think we can uh, get quite a bit more uh, to, to, towards uh, working with generalized AI. Right? So that's uh, what interests me right now. I will give you a couple more things. Oh, where's the library again? Where the hell is the library? Okay, we have the library for you. Um, it's a single, simple example of fast and frugal heuristics being used. Uh, the fast and frugal tree, what it does is you have the decision tree, right? And the decision tree, the challenge is that it looks at, uh, you know, what happens if A happens and what happens if homeowner or renter, right? And then within homeowner, X and Y, within that X and Y, right? It keeps splitting the data and makes it bigger and bigger tree. Uh, fossil fuel trees deals with human decision making. And what it does is uh, in the first box, right? You say yes or no, right? It doesn't care about the no, it stops, stops studying the no. It only cares about the yeses. 
right? So what effectively it has done is it has immediately, when it's trying to emulate human decision-making behavior, it has immediately truncated or chopped off the entire no side of the story. So every time you uh, break up the tree, right? You split the tree, right? If a yes or no, yes or no, right? You can, you can, uh, it, it, it doesn't even care about the no's. You're saying that like, look, um, patient comes in with a chest pain, right? Um, the doctor thinks about it, that should I put this person in the emergency or not? They check, they don't have the time to optimize their data. So what the way a doctor would take decisions is based on two or three very simple heuristics. Right? What is the pressure, high or no, low, right? Uh, if it's high or low, uh, de depending on the pressure, yes or no, emergency room. If no, if the pressure is, you know, it's, it's not high enough, if no, then what are the other things that I want to think about? I don't even think about those. A human being does not think like that. Right? So what we want to do is we are going to truncate the nose and just keep going on the yes, right? So we split the tree, yes or no, get rid of the nose, only think of the yes, again, split it, yes or no, again, go to the yes, and so on and so forth. Right? So it's a, it's a wonderful way of classifying things. Right? Martian, Laura, Laura Martian, uh, fantastic work. Um, and there is a library. Okay, so Nate Phillips uh, wrote a library in R, uh, saved again. Uh, we were, we were. Uh, this is stuff that we had started work on at the firm uh, of, of creating a Python package. Uh, but uh, he he made it, uh, made the made the Python one as well. So just go and take a look. I think you'll find it very interesting. What else? I've spent two minutes on econophysics. Um, uh, it, you know, and, and I'm not gonna go deeper into it. Um, I'll probably ask. Uh, People I know in this field to come and talk more. I, I've I've done some work and did a couple of uh, things, but uh, not enough to you know, go, go and talk a lot. But what econophysics guys are trying to do is they're trying to take methods from statistical mechanics, right, and, and thermodynamics, and applying it to to complex systems research, right, to 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 real life problems like financial markets, uh, like sociology, and uh, so on and so forth. Okay, um, uh, Damia, I, I I know uh, met him a few times. Uh, and his work on the minority game, which is the toy model for financial markets, uh, you know, uh, helped uh, with my work and I, uh, part of my thesis. Wrote a, wrote a paper about it. Um, but uh, what what they're trying to do is figuring out laws, right? So going beyond that, and this was physicists love to do, right? So Anirban, who's an advisor to my firm and, and somebody you know very very well. Um, he, he, he's one of the best econ he's one of the best known economists in the world actually um, and works with complex systems. So uh, you should see his work, right? Uh, and, and if you want to know more about complex adaptive systems, the beauty of complex systems or adaptive complex systems is that once you define the parameters, right, you can let the whole thing evolve. So if you are thinking counterfactuals, right? If you have, a system that you have designed, right? So you have, you have created the design of the system. You said, okay, this is how the little organisms behave in that system, right? And now, once I have provided those parameters, I'm gonna put in a little bit of rain. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna put in a flood. Let's see what happens. I'm gonna put in the coronavirus. Let's see what happens, right? So complex systems, right? Adaptive complex systems, because remember it's adaptive the little uh, organisms that you have created, they will adapt their parameters based on um, the external environment, right? Again, where is the library? The library, a little bit more effort, try NetLogo, right? And once comfortable, try Gamma. Uh, NetLogo, uh, and the, and Gamma, the beauty is it, it even allows you to incorporate uh, GIS files. So you, you can look at geographical files, you can just you know, put them in and you can, if you can provide decent quality parameters, uh, figure out how a city will grow. Uh, what we are very interested in, I, you know, I, I run a startup called PropMap, which uses some of the stuff that I talked about for, for real estate data. What we, are, we, we, what we are very interested in, we work on often, is taking these geographical files to figure out what's gonna happen to real estate in, in different parts of the area. Or in, in the current situation, how's, how's a virus going to behave? All right, so in conclusion, I think uh, what I wanted to incorporate here and I talked about a lot of things, uh, sorry about that, uh, but um, it, it, I want you, guys, want, want you guys to start thinking about data science for the new normal. Data science is completely dependent on history. Unfortunately, historical dependencies change. Right? The behavior 
right, of a human being to a particular input changes. It doesn't remain the same. Okay. Uh, in time series, we call that regime change. And we all talk about stability of our models, that how unstable the model is. The problem is that once the regime change happens, all your joint probability distributions and, and, and association rules go for a toss. So the bottom rung of the causality ladder changes completely. What doesn't change is that if you are used to uh, counterfactual, so hashtag ANN, hashtag A, epic fail. LOL, right? So that was my uh, attempt at, at, at connecting to a younger audience, right? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if that's what people are using nowadays, but I thought that that, that might be, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's stuff that you guys would, would appreciate. Um, so, so I think the problem is how do I, and, and this is what the original, one of the titles that I thought of was how to do data science without priors, right? If I don't have priors, how would I do data science? Figure out a way to figure out counterfactuals. What if, the virus had not happened, what would have happened? So I'll, I'm gonna use causal, so, so we, have, we run this small group within the firm called uh, the labs, right, Donna Labs. Uh, and, and what we are very interested in, and if you are interested in, of course, do reach out to us, is, is doing data science without priors. So we use, use using causal inferencing from Perl, using behavioral economics from Herb Simon and Gagarinzer and that, that kind of chain of thought, and, and stuff from econophysics from Eugene Stanley and Charlotte. Uh, and of course, a little bit of game theory, first love, right? Can't go wrong. Uh, and, and you're off to a good start. And if you really interested and you have, you, if you do read through some of this and you do want to do want to do more stuff in this area, um, you know, either at, at the workplace uh, or, 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 you know, as a research project or whatever have you, but do the reading before you, you know, reach out. But, you know, if you think that you're, you're, you're doing stuff here, these three things interest you or large chunks of them interest you, you have done the readings, uh, do reach out to us and, and uh, you're, you're always on the lookout for people, uh, good people to, you know, for, for internships, for jobs, for working together, for writing papers together, whatever. Uh, but I think data science, uh, as we do it, it, it it's changing, right? And uh, there's a new normal in, in the world right now. And the way to work with the new normal will be to figure out uh, ways like laws, right, of physics. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, the laws of physics and chemistry. You can look at a star, which is a billion light years away. Just by looking at the color spectrum, you can tell what metal there is, right? Yeah. So the laws don't change. Okay. Uh, similarly, human behavior, right, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something that, you know, yes, human behavior changes, obviously it changes. But just because there is a virus or a recession, suddenly people won't behaviorally change. Human beings are human beings. Some of their behavior will change. But if you can identify what the behavior is, right? how do human behave, beings behave, behave differently with certain types of intervention, then um, getting to a counterfactual, right? making predictions, that becomes, I think, much more scientific right? than what we're doing today. Right. Similarly for causal inferencing. All right. Sorry, I, I, I was I'm way over time. It's 1240. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, but uh, thanks a lot. And I, I hope I you know, could, could uh, get you guys I, excited about some things. I don't see anybody complaining. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, be fantastic. I was just thinking that there's something that's missing from the Zoom interface, and that's a standing ovation, right? So I think oh, yeah, this really has been an incredible talk, and I think this is what uh, I love about being in this space, is the fact that it brings together thought. You know, there should be a liberal uh, data science degree that exists, right? Yeah, that brings yeah. together. And I think I'm going to try and create one of those. So I need Do, do, do that. Count me in, yeah. Yeah, yeah brilliant. Uh, you know, there, there have been people obviously asking questions on the side, uh, and you've been doing a great job of answering them. Uh, I did see a hand being raised by Snehal. Snehal, do you want to ask your question? Uh, hello, Mr. Sanya. Hi. Call me Hi. Okay. It was, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So it was a great talk, and I like your sense of humor, how you inculcated it in the talk. Uh, one thing, a bit of stalking showed me that, that uh, you have your you did your PhD in analyzing rationality in financial decision making using data sciences. So oh, okay. I just want to know how did you kind of merged behavioral economics uh, with data sciences, and 
I what I infer is this is more of behavioral psychology with uh, a bit of uh, you know economics with data science. So how is that? How was the journey? Uh, uh, okay, uh, I mean, wow! Somebody actually looked up the topic of my PhD thesis. I never thought that would happen, uh, but. <laughs> So, <laughs> had this before anybody other than your advisor bringing it up? I don't know. Sorry. But he 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 has this right. Uh, I don't. But anyway, uh, yeah. So uh, you see, a lot of the work that I did in that uh, in my thesis, uh, it's primarily three different, very distinct chapters, uh, <clears throat> and I I got great, fantastic guidance from some of the people I know in the in the academic world. Um, so one thing that I did was. Uh, and I can talk about, uh, you know, so uh, uh, we looked at some financial data, right? And tried to figure out that in that data set, whose loan gets accepted and why, right? So we, we started off with doing pure data science, ML, all the algorithms that you can think of, uh, tuning the hyperparameters, this, that, and the other. So, and we came up with a whole set of models, right? Then the behavioral question that I wanted to ask was that are human beings rational when they give out loans? Right? Because this data set is a data set from uh, open source data source called uh, of peer-to-peer -peer networks, right? So where individuals lend money to each other, right? Through a web interface. Okay. So this is not a bank. This is individuals giving loans. Banks, I can understand, are rational, right? They have you know modelers and risk analytics and, and that and the other. My question was that are human beings rational? And uh, somebody who read the Kahneman stuff before, I thought human beings are stupid. I, I still hold human beings are stupid, nothing against that. <laughs> but, but, um, but I wanted to figure out that do human beings behave rationally? That means that the, the way I think about defaults, if the users use the same variables to give out loans with the opposite sign, right? That if my income ratio is high, my chances of default is higher, right? Because I have a lot of debt. Now, if I see, that normal retail investors give loans to people whose debt to income ratios are low, right? So the opposite sign. So likelihood of acceptance of the loan has an opposite sign of the likelihood of default. That's rational behavior. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so what we did was we used techniques from data science to establish rationality, right? And, and surprisingly enough, to me at least, uh, when taking financial decisions in this case, um, and, and we looked at, 13, 15 million data points, right? It was enormous data and we ran everything, right? Neural nets, SVM, blah, 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 whatever you want to talk about. Uh, no, do, no do, you know, do pro, do why, right? We didn't run that. Uh, because again, it's, it's, it's data that's from the outside world, right? So you cannot run a you know, control or uh, you, know, you don't have a control. Uh, so there will be self-selection bias, obviously. People who are going to a peer-to-peer -peer lending site, that means that they cannot go to a bank for a while. Um, so that's that's one of the things that I did. The other chapter was on minority game, uh, which is a toy market. And I, we, we tried to figure out with an experiment that what happens when you introduce taxes uh, in, in currency trading markets. Right. So that has been published as a paper. The first one has not been, I'm, I'm about to submit it. The, first, the second one has been published already, uh, the effect of taxation on the currency market uh, or a toy market minority game. Um, the third paper is about risk, of, the third chapter uh, is about risk aversion. Uh, and we looked at data and differential behavior dealing with risk aversion uh, in uh, multiple countries using data from Deal or No Deal, the game show. Deal or No Deal, uh, I don't know if you've seen that. It's basically a lottery, right? Uh, so so uh, Glenn Harrison uh, was very, very kind, lent me all his code. This guy's genius, one of the greatest people doing work on risk aversion. Um, the P2P stuff, GERD was very kind. He looked through stuff. Uh, the minority data, Damien Chalet, uh, the guy who invented the minority game, read through my chapter. Uh, you have to be brave. You just have to reach out to people or meet them in conferences. And they, they did. I mean, it's amazing that how these legends in the field read my chapters. Uh, and just ask them. I mean, they, didn't, they don't know me from Adam. And they, hey, I'm a PhD student. They wanna, uh, can you help me? And they read through my chapter. So do that. Do that. Reach out to people. Yes. Be brave. Uh, but so, yeah, so there's there's a... A lot of ways you can bring decision science and data science together. And uh, these are some of the ways that I, I found interesting. But nice. you can see that ultimately we are trying to get to decisions, right? That's that's how right, right. true. It Sorry, is, long answer, but yeah, please go. Yeah. No, worries. that is great. So it's it's uh, uh, it's interesting to see that uh, people uh, like humans are usually irrational, but in terms of money, they are quite rational. Yeah, yeah. They behave very irrationally with. <laughs> 
they, they behave very rationally with the taxes. And these are the experiment on MBA students with real money, right? Uh, these are economic so, experiments with real financial incentives. Uh, and even MBA students are very rational. The moment we introduce taxes, they're like, well, I don't want to trade. But it's a 2% tax. Right? Just the word tax, they're like, oh. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they can be rational and irrational. That's, that's the beauty of it. Right? Otherwise, what's the point? If you're machines, then traditional economic theory would have been great. It's not. But don't get me wrong, you have to read that stuff right before you get into this nonsense. So you, you need to understand uh, basic micro theory and game theory for sure, uh, before you get interested in decisions. For sure. I think there is- Thank you. One right. more question there. Uh, I am uh, you know, uh, looking at the time, but I think there is another question that uh, Diksha, you've asked here. I yes. don't know if it's, it's been answered. Yes, Diksha says, yeah, I can see that. One question, how are neurons not affecting the psychology? Because whatever we think conscious or subconscious starts going by poets. So how will we differ? Uh, very, very good question. I, I knew somebody would ask this. <laughs> it all boils down to neurons, you more. Okay, uh, yes, it does. Uh, but what I'm trying to say is that what we are doing with the ANNs is we are trying to emulate the processing of information as a physiological process, right? So some signals going in, signal coming out, right? So it's an electrochemical signal that's going in, an electric uh, uh, impulse going out, going all the way up to the brain and does the reaction and so on and so forth, right? Uh, so what are we doing? We are trying to look at that physiological structure and trying to emulate it. What I'm saying is that if you are looking at human level intelligence, right, if you're trying to emulate that, don't try to emulate the atom. You see, when you, are, when you are rowing a boat, you can do an atomic study to figure out that what is the pressure of the water, the H2O, the intramolecular pressure, you know, the air speed, the wind speed uh, at a very atomic level, right? And calculate exactly how you should row your boat, okay? Uh, so then you have gone to the very basics, beautiful stuff, right? Very fascinating. But that's not productive. Right? Otherwise, we wouldn't have chemistry as a different science. Chemistry would have been just physics. And biology would have been all chemistry. Why do you need biology, right? It's all ultimately organic chemistry, most of it, right? But when you're looking at biological structures, right, just using the underlying chemical patterns you would be, at some point, physics would be able to solve all of biology, right? And there would be no need for, you know, the difference between a living versus a non-living organism in the eyes of physics. Still, we are not clear, right? Physically, we are not clear. Biologically, we know. So sometimes aggregations actually help, okay? So that's, that's what I'm trying to, trying to say here, that you, you can go to the smallest little bit piece, which is a neuron, and emulate that. Instead, why don't we emulate something that's a bit more aggregate? in human behavior. Sir, can I say a word? So yes, yes, please, please. It's amazing and uh, what you are just <laughs> talking and I love it. And okay. it definitely sparks a, you. you know interest in the subject. Um, okay. But Good. what I was thinking was we, when we talk of one neuron, that's one, uh, you know, path, right? That we yeah. are talking about. Yeah. Um, what I was coming for is like maybe our behaviors are, are a result of a different set of reactions that go sure. on in our yes. mind. Yes. Like again yeah. through yes. neurons, but then but then how the, how do we actually behave and what is the correct thing? And at uh, when we are doing something, we know both the things, right? So this is correct, sure. but this is that's what I want. Right. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get your point. So so rational versus irrational behavior and 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 doing the right thing versus excited by the wrong things. Yeah, there, there's a lot of very interesting research on hyperbolic discounting. Uh, Ted O'Donoghue, uh, Matt Rabin, uh, you know, Ted O'Donoghue is at Berkeley. Uh, and of course, Leibson, the original work of Leibson on, on hyperbolic discounting. Uh, you want to look at that because basically what happens is when we see something and we can have it now, right? I, I know that I don't want to become fat, but I see some fries. <sighs> I'll just eat it up, right? That's that's called hyperbolic discounting. That anything that happens good today is worth a lot more than good stuff happening over the next twenty years. Okay, some solid research on quantifying that as well. That how, what what are the parameters of that hyperbolic discounting? You, you, you can actually get the research. Good good ways to quantify that. You, you might want to read that. Yeah, good stuff. I'll do that, sir. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So deep. I mean, you know, what you're saying is. Uh, 
if I if I can paraphrase it, and you tell me yes. if I'm right or wrong on this, but uh, <laughs> what you're saying is that you, you know the neural network as it stands today is a very simplistic model of what actually happens within the human brain, right? Uh, and and so uh, there is a lot that we don't understand of the human brain. These kind of what we see as irrational behaviors, we don't understand how those are triggered by the brain. Um, and, and we can't possibly, therefore, uh, incorporate that into the current models. And, and there's a lot to right. learn uh, in some right. Way, right? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and basically, I'm the, the first part, right, the la larger part of the talk, and, and which is what is probably the straight up next step today, right? Bringing behavioral economics to this, economics to this, yes, that's going to happen. It's going to take time. It's happening already. Don't get me wrong. There are a lot of people doing great work. But I think a, a direct next step today is using the do calculus, mm -hmm. right? Using structural equation models uh, to, to, to move from these association rules. Today's AI is all about association rules. Sure. This can do it much better, right? The basic linear algebra, and Sarab, you know it much more than I do. The basic linear algebra, the basic optimization techniques that we are doing today with neural nets. Is it earth shatteringly difficult, different from what we were doing 20 years back? We have more computational power. Yes, we have made changes. We have we don't, I mean, absolutely made changes. We are doing different things. Uh, but, but are we still moving up that ladder of causality and saying that what if this intervention had happened? Or what if, uh, you know, Gandhiji had not died? I don't know. But, but do it, humans know? Do humans know? They can no. only postulate, right? They can postulate, yes. I, I want my AI, right? I want my AI to start <laughs> saying, Ki bas Sachin ne to wo square cut agar nahi, whatever karta to, you know, like, we would have won the game, right? One small snake of the pack. Right. AI to do that, because then AI can be creative. Not formal AI. Uh, because today's, today's use of AI in, in, in the creative arts is so formal AI. Uh, I was at the National Institute of Design, NID in Ahmedabad, uh, talking to the you know, student there. And I told them that, look, you guys are our only hope. Because this stupid AI that we have today, it just gives us formulas, man. I mean, and, and, and Shah Rukh Khan's using that formula, I guess. And making movies which are unwatchable. But because it's popular, he's making more and more unwatchable movies. Right? Because it sells. <laughs> Sorry. Nothing against Shah Rukh Khan. Just, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. All right. That's, uh, hey, guys. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, a class to go to. But I, I'd love you to stay here forever, but uh, unfortunately, I think uh, you've got things to do. And uh, you know, I'm sure, uh, sorry, I, I have a one o'clock class. I, I have some students hanging out here, so they, they'll be like, <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much, Deep. It's been a, a breath of fresh air this uh, webinar, and uh, you know, we'd love to hear more from you in the future. And uh, really, you know, I, I think we will definitely connect uh, outside of this webinar because I'd love to learn some of the things that you've been referring to because you obviously come from a different background to where uh, I come from. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think uh, I really believe that it, today uh, we are, in India at least, I think we are digging a grave for ourselves over and over again, right? So by, by training people in data science, supposedly, where they are basic yeah. Python programmers that are using libraries, <laughs> Uh, we are just waiting. Even good for Python programmers. programmers. I wish there were great Python programmers. Do that. My yeah, problem. even even that's uh, the fantastic difference, Python right? programmers. So, so most of the time, data scientists are, are poor Python programmers, right? <laughs> <laughs> or bad Python programmers. Uh, but I think uh, you know uh, what what we're just setting ourselves for is the next wave, right? The uh, industrial revolution 5.0, if you want to call it, where you know again these people are going to get thrown out of jobs, right? If yeah. we don't really think deeper and actually start yes. looking at the levels that you're talking but about, AutoML is going to kill you, man. I mean, exactly, and it should, right? Because should. I always if... say that any jobs that you take that are brain numbing and and destroying your neurons are actually a bad thing, right? So we should yes. not be getting excited about jobs that are actually going to be replaced by machines. In the yeah. near future, we should be creating thought processes like what you have suggested. Yeah. So thank you again. It's been a pleasure having you on on this uh, webinar series, and I hope that we will get you again sometime. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Sara. Really. Right. Take care. Just a second. Just a second. Just a second. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, so I just forgot the term. Uh, I just. Uh, uh, I just couldn't take a note of the term you mentioned for. Uh, the behavior when people uh,
to what's in, what's more profitable in short term in term oh yeah uh, 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 i'll type I'll, I'll type that it's hyperbolic okay. discounting okay. so you want to look at the work of late uh, Okay. Which is what we are doing from a data science perspective in this country, I guess. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Perfect <laughs> example. Perfect example. You're like, do it today, and then we'll see what happens later. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Deepu. It's thanks. been a pleasure. Right. Thanks for having me over, guys. I really appreciate Bye. everybody's time on a Saturday morning and afternoon. Uh, I, I know that you all had better things to do, but you came and listened to me. So not at all. This has been a pleasure. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.